Thank you. We depend on this for our survival. Each of us. Which means we should share it and look after it. But unfortunately, we seem to be taking it to the breaking point. Why? Why are we doing this? We know what the problems are. We've known what the problems are for quite a while. Something always seems to stop us. Why? I remember March 2000, reading about the B-15 iceberg that broke off the Ross Ice Shelf. In the newspaper it said, it was all part of a normal process. A little bit further on in the newspaper, it said a loss that would normally take the ice shelf 50 to 100 years to replace. That same word, normal, had now two different, almost opposite meanings. If when we leave today, we bump into the B-15 iceberg outside, we're going to bump into something that's 1,000 feet tall, 76 miles long, 17 miles wide, and it's going to weigh two gigatons. And I'm sorry, there's nothing normal about that. And yet I think it's this perspective that we have as humans to look at our whole world that we're in today as if it's normal, which is one of these major forces that stops us taking on real change. Only 90 days after this, arguably the greatest discovery of the last century occurred. It was the first sequencing of the human genome. This is the stuff that's in every single one of our 50 trillion cells that makes us who we are and what we are. If we take just one of your cells and open it up and take this code and stretch it out, it's a meter long and it's two nanometers wide. Two nanometers is just 20 hydrogen atoms in a line. And I wondered, what if we could find answers to some of our biggest problems in the smallest of places where the difference between what is valuable and what is worthless is merely the addition or subtraction of a couple of atoms? And what if we could get control over the essence of energy, the electron? So I started to go around the world trying to find some of the best and brightest scientists whose collective discoveries have the chance to take us there. And we formed a company to fund their extraordinary ideas such that we can stop doing this and instead we can generate, store and use energy cheaply and safely and cleanly right where we are. Now imagine our home looking like this. In the middle of summer, we have a tremendous amount of power coming in in the form of light, which we want, and heat that is now coming into a place that we're trying to keep cool. In winter, almost exactly the opposite is happening. We get a little bit of light, but now all the heat is inside the room, and that's all trying to escape out through the window. It'd be really great if we could have like a little switch on the window that could either reflect away the heat or bounce it back into the room. Surprisingly, one of the materials that can do this is something that is made in this incredibly exquisitely beautiful reaction, where we take carbon, graphite, 
and we vaporize it at a very high temperature, and when it reforms back into the carbon, it comes back into a completely different type of carbon that looks like this. Chicken wire rolled up with a twist. But this is called a carbon nanotube. This is 100,000 times thinner than a single hair on your head. It's 100 times the strength of steel. It's 1,000 times more conductive than copper. How is that possible? Well, one of the really weird things about dealing with things at the nanoscale is things look and they act very differently. You know carbon as black. Carbon, when it's like this, is totally transparent and bendable. Which means, if I combine it with a polymer, apply a little charge to it, in its colored state, it reflects away all heat and light, and when it's in its transparent state, it lets all heat and light through into the room, and any combination in between. As we developed this idea, we came across something quite remarkable. Think about the amount of power we're using every day to do this, the world over. It'd be really nice to be able to turn off every light. Well, for that, we would have to see at night, which we don't. A lot of animals do. This lets you do it. It's a couple of nanometer layer films that take infrared at light, which is widely available. And when it hits the film, it converts that infrared light into an electron, and then you can present it as an image, which I could see through and see at night. I'm going to show you what it looks like to look through Firstly, it's incredibly transparent. I'm able to see through. And now, I'm going to show you. I'm going to put the camera on this side and show you what it looks like. Some of you have seen night vision. It's sort of that green fuzz and other green fuzz, and it's all, all mixed in. This is of a set of keys at night, looking through a thin piece of glass with virtually no power. You can pick out depth perception, you can pick out contrast. You can, gosh, see. And this is the first prototype. But then it dawned on us when we were working on this. What if we took the thin film that we affixed to your window, rollable, changes the amount of heat and light that's going to come into a room, and combine it with being able to take an electron, which was generated by infrared light that we don't see, and we put them together. Your window becomes your power plant, as does any other surface that I can stick this to. Now, we've talked about generating and using light, energy, in different ways. But one of the things we've got to think about is how would we store the electrons that we've just generated? The best technology in the world is something that was invented 150 years ago in France. There's nothing better in terms of dollars per watt of electricity stored. But it's got two problems, the lead and the acid. And that stops each one of us wanting to put a rack of 50 of these in our basements. 
So we went to a group of incredible scientists and we said, can you build this? I actually drew this on the back of a napkin at a diner outside Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And instead of being laughed out of the place, they went, yep. Well, that yup is this. This is now called eBox. And it is, we're now testing new nanomaterials. Haven't figured it all out yet, but the goal is to be able to park an electron on a surface and just hold it there until you need it, whereby you can pop it off and take it to where you need it. When you combine these puzzle pieces, it means that we're able to generate, conserve, and store energy where we are. And if we don't need it, it's my electron, right? I've made it on my window and I've stored it in my house. And I don't need it because I'm on holiday. I can bring it back up to my window and transmit it through the air to your window. And you can reverse it. Which means the energy grid of tomorrow is no grid. And energy will one day be free. By solving our puzzle pieces this way, you get the last puzzle piece for free. Water. Because water actually is energy. Each of us, because we're human, need eight glasses of this per day. Just eight glasses. Didn't seem to take too much effort to do that, did it? Just eight glasses. Do you know what happens if you don't get this after five days? Every single human starts to go into shock without this. So this actually isn't optional, right? When we run out of water, as we are, and have already done so in some parts of the world, we're going to have to get it from the sea, of which we've got a lot. Unfortunately, it's in the wrong form. And the way you take it from that form into this form is through something like this, a desalination plant. If I could just wave a wand and say there's no more fresh water tomorrow, for every one of us on the planet to get just eight glasses, we're going to have to spend $19 trillion on desalination plants. And I know in today's financial crisis, we hear these trillions all over the place. A trillion is a stack of dollar bills, and 19 trillion of them go all the way from here to the moon and back. I don't see many of them lying around. <laughs> Fortunately, the second thing we're going to have to do with this, because these just don't run by themselves, they take power to run them. So for eight glasses, for you, for me, for everybody, per day, times everyone in the world, that's going to take twice the world's supply of oil. And we're going to burn up our planet in the process, even faster than we are. But in a world where energy has been freed by harnessing and copying nature, with some of the things I've shown you, it means we can take any water, wherever we are, and convert it into the form that we need right where we are, cleanly, safely, and cheaply. Now, my journey, I used to be a venture capitalist, changed, and it changed 18 years ago. It changed when I saw a photograph. And I've carried this photograph with me ever since. This is the photograph. It was taken by Kevin Carter, who went to the Sudan to film their drought. It's tough to see this and just assume it's business at normal. Because on every scale, that is wrong. 
On every scale, this is wrong. We have to do better than this. We should do better than this, because this cannot be the next normal. In about two weeks, the seven billionth person is going to be born onto this planet, into a world where we've just heard in about 13 years, two-thirds of the water is going to be under some form of water stress. We're already burning up one and a half planets worth in our insatiable need for more. That can't be our new normal. It just can't be our new normal. And some of the things I showed you today enable us to be able to really deliver a human bill of rights that every single one of us deserve to have every single day. And the how to do this is to be able to back the scientists all around the world that are within an arm's length of gaining exquisite control over one of the building blocks of the universe, the simple electron. Thank you.